Hello students, this is Mr. Kraft coming to you from my house on this frozen day. I want to do a, an overall review of solving quadratic equations by taking square roots. Uh, we were talking about that the last day we met in class in person, and I want to review the basic ideas. So to start off, just as a quick reminder, when I say quadratic equation, I mean one that is in this format, ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is not equal to zero. Uh, b could be zero, that means you might have no x term, or, and c could be zero, that means you could have no numerical term. But you have to have a, a square at least. So, Basically, instead of factoring, which is a technique we've been using previously, we're looking at taking the square root. And that comes back to the basic idea of a square root of some number, the square root of 2, the square root of 36, the square root of 8, numbers like that. And there are three basic situations that you can have in cases like this. In some cases, a square root simply doesn't go down any farther. It does not simplify. Now, of course, we could always approximate the square root of 3 as 1.732, but in actual practice, we don't do that. We generally, in an algebraic context, don't like to use decimals that are uh, irrational, they don't end and they don't repeat, so you always have to round up. So we leave the square root of 3 alone. Uh, the other case is where you have a perfect square root. The root of 36 is 6, and of course that's plus or minus 6. And technically, you should have a plus or minus here as well. If it's a perfect square root, and this is where it comes from knowing your times tables, or from using the roots table, the powers table that I gave you, it just comes down to a whole number. The third case is a little bit of both of these. The square root of 8 itself does not come out even, but I can break 8 down to 4 times 2, where 4 is a perfect square. Two or more things multiplied under a radical are the same thing as two things under separate radicals multiplied together. So the root of a product is the same thing as a product of two roots. I've said this before. You've seen me do this before. This part comes out because the root of 4 is 2. Then I just leave it as 2 square root of 2, plus or minus, of course. So this is your basic way of getting your roots. Now, of course, in the special case that the radicand, and remember, whatever is underneath the radical, which is the sign, that looks kind of like a pointy division sign, whatever is under it is the radicand. So anyway, when the radicand is negative, you do exactly the same thing, except you toss in an i. So this would be i square root of 3, plus or minus, of course. This would be plus or minus 6i. You always put the i after the real number. But when you have an i with a root, it comes in front of the radical. Because if you put it there, it would look like it went under the radical, and that would be bad on all levels. And in this case, you would get plus or minus 2i root of 2. So basically, you do the same process with a negative as you would with a positive, except in the end, you stick an i in there. So basically, that's no big deal. Okay. The simplest situation where you take a square root in order to get to solve a quadratic uh, 
of course, it always has to be equal to zero to begin with. Let me put my square there. Um, okay. In all these cases, you want to get your number to the far side by adding or subtracting, whichever the case may be, so that you have just x equals, x squared equals something or the other, whatever it is. Then, once you're there, you want to end up with x by itself. You want to end up with x equals something. So just like here, I want to get the x by itself. So my first step is to subtract to both sides, or in this case, to add to both sides. So same way here, you take the root of both sides. And in all of these cases, the square root of x squared is always going to be x. That's the reason we're doing it. We want to get a plain old x by itself. And then we just use techniques we talked about to get the answer. The square root of 81 is 9 and is plus or minus. And since the radicand is negative, it has to be 9i. So that's the answer in this particular case. The square root of 49 is positive. No need to have i's. Square root of 49 is 7, but you always want to be plus or minus. 10 uh, cannot be simplified. It does not have an even square root, nor can it be simplified. So you just slap a plus or minus to the left of it. Boom, you're done. Nothing else. 32. Well, 32 negative 32, of course, is negative 16 times 2. Um, the perfect square part takes the negative with it because the negative can come out as a plain old i. So I don't want to leave the negative over here with 2. 2 is going to stay under there. The negative is not. I mean, if you wanted to be mind-numbingly precise, you could say negative 1 times 16 times 2, and then do it piece by piece. This is i, this is 4, this is the root of 2. Then you rearrange it so it looks right, 4i root of 2, plus or minus. But that really is much more difficult than it has to be. I would not recommend you doing it that way by any means. So it's better to do it as just a one-stop shop. The 16, whoops, this, the 16 is four, the root of 16 is four, plus or minus four is negative, so it becomes four i times the square root of two. So that basically is that, that's easy enough. Now you get more nuanced situations when you have something like this. Suppose I had three x squared, oh, I don't know, minus 75, just to give a really simple example. Well, basically what you're doing is the same thing that I've told you a hundred times. Sam, simplify, add, and by add, I include subtraction and multiply, and by multiply, I include division. So you have no simplification to be done. There's no extra x squares or numbers or whatever drifting about. So I'm going to say that's already taken care of. So I'm going to go down to addition. And I literally am adding in this case because the 75 is negative. Positive cancels out a negative, and so you get this. But I don't want to ta start taking square roots until I get this x squared completely by itself. I do not want to have that coefficient there. So I have to deal with my division or multiplication, as the case may be. 
Divide both sides by 3, I get x squared equals 25. Now, I have one more step. I have to take a root. But if I said S-A-M-R, that would be SAMR, <laughs> which makes no sense. I guess I could say square root. Then I could say SAMS. This is SAMS problem, not mine. But whatever. So I take the root of each side, and then I'm back to doing what I was doing before. The x squared becomes x, plus or minus 5. And if that would have been something that didn't come out even, or that had to be simplified, or what have you, then that would be fine. A slight variation of that. Oh, let's just make it interesting. So, this is similar to the last problem. Sam, once more. And we're going to take the 100 over by subtracting it. So, we get 3x squared equals negative 100. So, we got that. Divide both sides by 3. And then we get negative 100 over 3, which is an improper fraction. And as I've said many times before, once you get to pre-algebra and on up, we don't worry about improper fractions. Improper fractions are no big deal. However, I could not really, well, I could make this a mixed number. If I were to make it a mixed number, I would get 33 and a third, but that would be very difficult to deal with as a root. It's like, you don't want to go there. Uh, a third is a repeating decimal. That is very bad also. So we do not want to make this thing be anything besides a nice little improper fraction. So when we take the root of both of these guys, that gives us the square root of negative 100 over 3. So, when it's all under the radical, you can break it up into separate parts. So, the radical, the root of a quotient, is the quotient of roots. And then negative 100, the root of 100 is 10, and I don't know why I put that negative sign there. It should not be there. The root of 100 is 10, and it's negative, so it's 10i over the root of 3. But we don't want to have a radical in the bottom. You never, ever, ever want to leave a radical in the denominator, ever. You know, we talked about this in class the other day. We must rationalize it. We must rewrite it. So I'm going to come up here, 10i over root of 3. I have to multiply the deal by the root of 3 over itself. Why? Because on the denominator side, the root of 3 times the root of 3, basically what you're saying is the root of 3 squared. I don't normally write that out explicitly, but if you, if you wanted to have an intermediate step like that to make it clear to yourself what's going on, then, you know, that, that's, that's you. I, I have no problem with that. Whatever works for you and gets you correct answers. The square root of 3 times itself, in other words, squared, clears the radical. It just becomes plain old 3, which is what I want. And that leaves me 10i root of 3. And then the last thing I have to do, which I have saved for last... This equal sign doesn't look very good, so I'm going to redraw it. I have to put my plus or minus in. Always put your plus or minus in. Because every root, well, every number has two square roots. A positive and a negative. So this is what you do here. You just, if the, if the, if the fraction does not simplify out, 
if you can't reduce it to a whole number, if it doesn't go into it evenly, all you do is you break it up, rationalize it, and then you are good to go. Okay, another situation could be you have something like this. So you might have um, something like, you might have something where you've got numbers on both sides. And in that case, you would just take your numerical part over and then once more you take the root of both sides and you get x is plus or minus 5. You might, I'm not sure if your book has any examples like this, but I'll go ahead and do one anyway. You might even have something weird like this. You might have uh, x cubed plus x equals zero. And I give that as the simplest possible version. In that case, as is often the situation, you start with GCF, greatest common factor. The greatest common factor is x itself. So in this case, since I've got a cube there, this is a cubic equation, that means I will have up to three answers. So I use the zero product property which is just a very pompous and fancy way of saying that if you have things multiplied by each other and they give zero, one of them has to be zero. So to do this, I take each portion and set it to zero. I set x equal to zero, so x equals zero. Boom, there's your answer right there. Nothing more needs to be done. I set this equal to zero, though, and now I'm back to the exact kind of problem I've been doing, and then I do my SAM business. Get the one over there, x equals negative one, and so... Um, Take the root of both sides, x equals plus or minus i. And you could even have a situation where you might have something like maybe, I don't know, say, uh, I don't know, 14x squared, x cubed rather, sorry. Uh, let's make it more interesting. 14x cubed minus 7x equals 0. In this case, the greatest common factor of the GCF is 7x. We pull out 7x. 7 into 14 goes 2, and that leaves x squared. x out of x cubed equals x squared. 7 out of itself equals 1. 7x out of 7x equals 1. So I set this equal to zero and therefore divide both sides, x equals zero. That's your first answer. And then you have two x squared minus one equals zero. Two x squared equals one. Two x squared, I'm gonna divide each side by two to get the x squared by itself. And so you're gonna have x squared equals a half. Take the root of each of those guys, and that gives me the square root of a half, which is the root of one over the root of two. The root of one, duh, is one. And then you have to rationalize this whole business by multiplying the denominator over itself by the whole fraction. 1 times the square root of 2 is, unsurprisingly, the square root of 2. and has to be plus or minus. And the square root of 2 times itself clears the fraction. And I told you that this is a cubic equation, so it has three answers. It's written as if it were two. I mean, if I were to write this in set notation, I would say 0, comma, plus or minus 0.5. 
root 2 over 2. But this is two separate answers. I just write them compactly. I mean, really, of course, it means negative root of 2 over 2 and 0 and positive root of 2 over 2. So this is two answers in one. 1, 2, 3. So three answers, which is what you'd expect to get from a cubic equation. Okay, I think that covers all the basic iterations I want to talk about. Uh, there's a one other thing I will say. Um, to go back to somewhere you don't solve by using the square root. If I had um, something like this, I would factor that down to x plus 3 squared. This is a perfect square. So I just have one answer. Because I set it equal to 0, they're the same. Two answers, but they're the same answer, so it boils down to 1. If I had something like x squared minus 81 equals 0, which is using the square root method that we talked about, and I'm skipping some steps here because we've discussed this at greater length, then I get x is plus or minus 9. And then if I have something like x squared plus 81, it's going to have the same thing happen. But then I have x equals plus or minus 9i. The point I'm getting at, and we will talk about something in quadratic equations that is called the discriminant later on. Uh, I'm not going to write that term down right now, but I'm showing you conceptually. Anytime you have a quadratic equation, it can have one answer that is a real number, no imaginaries, or you can have two real answers. You can't have more than two answers. Or you can have two imaginary answers. And building on that, you would have what's called complex answers. I'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, not today. But the point I'm getting is this. If you look at a parabola, and a parabola is a curve that looks kind of like that. And that's a pretty bad looking graph. Let me make a better looking graph. And that looks halfway competent. Um, there are basically three ways a parabola can behave. And that's a pretty bad graph too. A parabola in relationship to the x-axis. We don't care about the y-axis. I mean, you know these are the y-axis. But for what I'm going to show you, we don't care about that. Um, I've told you in the past that these answers to a quadratic equation are sometimes referred to as roots. And you see clearly why we call it that, because you're taking square roots many times. We also call them zeros because we're setting it equal to zero. The equation becomes zero there. Visually, what that means is this. A parabola could sit right on top of a graph where it touches the x-axis once and once only. That's what it means when you have a perfect square that has one answer. And... Um, this particular equation, it should be negative 3, it should be back here, but I'm not drawing this to scale. These are, don't match the, the actual equations. I'm just drawing you to show how it works. Here, the second possibility occurs. A parabola could intersect the x-axis two times. And in this case, it's positive 9 and negative 9. It could be totally different numbers, like 6 and 7 or negative 8 and 4, what have you. An imaginary root, well, I've showed you before, in your imagination, you could say the imaginary axis, the imaginary axis, 
is kind of like the z-axis for those of you who do three-dimensional work the imaginary axis comes out here into space but on the normal three-dimensional graph you can't actually see it so basically what happens is this is a parabola that does not touch the x-axis at all its roots are imaginary they're not even on the graph so it does not touch the x-axis at all so to summarize those are the three possible things that can happen a quadratic equation no matter whether you solve it by taking roots or by other methods and the root methods what we talked about tonight but I've shown you other methods before it can have up to but no more than two answers because its degree the exponent is two it can have one real answer and that means a parabola that sits on the graph or if it's a downward turn parabola it would hang from the graph we'll talk about those later it can have two real answers in which case it intersects the graph at two and only two places the last situation is two imaginary or complex root to be better put it and then it does not touch the x-axis at all and if it was going downward it would be not touching it okay that is the summary of what we're talking about today we will talk about more tomorrow. Have a great evening and a great rest of the week. And I hope that this has been helpful. Goodbye.